going to, we want you to get some sleep. So. No celebration. Um, oh, the questions there. Anybody figured them out? Every word, every heart, every heart, every heart, every heart, every heart, every and there may be some who don't, but I doubt it. I think all of them are wrong. What? Wrong. 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 Is it? Yes. Yeah. Because they don't say wrong. They no, they do say wrong. You got it for the wrong reason. Because it's, that's how they pronounce it. How do you pronounce wrong? Wrong. Uh, so you pronounce it wrong, too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I pronounce it wrong. Then yeah. if I said wrong. So, yeah, then I wouldn't. <laughs> I'd be pronouncing it. But every Harvard graduate oh. knows how to pronounce it wrong. Yeah. Hey, at least I got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, got it. Got it. So how about the other one? This Wait, is that, oh. The second one is requires deep thought. Okay. So don't say the answer if you two. figure it out. Not Just give everybody a chance to read it. The green part is what I'm asking about. There are three mistakes in this sentence. So that, that. Well, it's like mistake. Okay. And then the so we know. I get it. Matt, I know it. You had your hand up first. Yeah, it's mistake is spelling correctly. This is incomplete, and there are only two mistakes in the sentence. Right, which is uh, paradoxical. Uh, so it's like it's like looking at a mirror and a mirror and a mirror because once you realize there are just two mistakes, then it really is right. Why is Seth so tiny? Seth, you didn't draw much, and Natalie, I kind of forgot about her. Natalie kind of But she, she has a bigger problem than Seth. What happened to the winners of the most creative vote? We didn't have a category, I'm sorry. For the year, come on. Every time. First vote to get signed. Twice. 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 All right. Now the, the answers to the vote study guide. I'm going to go through this quickly. And what time do we have to be out? Do you know what the schedule is? Uh, I don't know, but there's a sale that everyone should go to. It's on my desktop. So we have until 1116, and I'll, I'll let you out. I promise not to keep you out. Yeah, yeah, no, there's performance at 10.30. But we don't usually... 10.30 is performance. No, okay, 10.30. Oh, yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. Shh. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where all the answers are. Those of you who haven't done Wait, it, don't look at all these before the you... The logs are due today. Due today. Yeah. Dang it. Do you not have it? I didn't know they were due today. I, it's, I've been <laughs> saying that every once in a while and putting it on my website. I'll just, I'll take off just a few points. Okay. Very minimal. Uh, just get it in next class. Okay, so I'm going to go fast. If you, normally I wouldn't just kind of read this to you, but I'm going to. Know that it's right here, and the reason I want to go over it at all is I think some of these are not totally understandable as they are, but most are. So number one, what types of boats have planing hulls? Boats that need to go fast. Speed boats. What's the function of a planing hull? The purpose is to lift the boat out of the water as the boat accelerates. Why? This decreases the force of drag by decreasing the boat's cross-sectional area that's exposed to the oncoming water. So as your boat lifts out, less water, less area is pushing against the water. The, a lot of these first few, these were warm-up kind, kinds of questions, and a lot of you have been absent, so some of you probably never saw these or talked about them. But this is a, I guess it looks like three different boats, but you understand, you can understand it from this. This is a boat creating some waves as your boat moves along, it creates a bow wave. And when your boat is moving slowly, the wavelength is short. And the boat is fine. When the boat's moving at what's called the hull speed, you create a bow wave. And the wavelength of this wave is the length of your boat. So you've got a hump in the front and a hump in the back, and the boat's fine. It's balanced. If you exceed the hull speed, then you create a wave longer than the length of the boat. You can see that your boat has to climb out of a hole that it's dug for itself. The boats become less efficient at the whole speed. Hi. Yeah. Number three. The, these are, I'll just read little groups of three starting from the left. Uh, so it's E, L, and D. And the next group, A, Q, and B. The next group, K, O, F. 
Wait, K O F. K O F. If you, we'll go back over them in a minute. Oh, that's then oh. M and P. J G N C. And finally H and I. Now, if there are any of those that you you Is think. Is this on the website? Yeah. Okay. If there are any of those where you've got them wrong and you don't really see why, let me know and I can explain. It might be my diagrams are a little confusing. On this one. I was hoping that you understand the arrow means forward, whereas J is actually the front of the boat. So J is the bow, K just means forward. And this arrow backward, that's aft, whereas N is actually the stern of the boat. And then this is the transom. So, you know, sorry about that. And if I had drawn a, a diagram like this, that'd be a better way of illustrating the transom, which is that back piece of the boat. But, Test over this stuff is going to be next Friday. Uh, not next class, because if you study this and then you realize later you don't understand it, you can ask me about it between now and then. So the shrink wrap, you do not have to have an answer this long. I just wanted to give a nice, complete answer so you'd understand it. You can shorten it yourself. What? As long as you explain enough so that the picture makes sense. Yeah. Did you ever hand back the packet that we did on this stuff? Oh, crap. Yeah, I was looking for that Wait, one. What about the people? I think I might have it right yeah. here. Yeah. No, I think I put it over there. Looks like there's a pretty big pile in the outside. Sorry, but I'm not the person there. anymore. Yeah, we uh, we retired. We were there. We were in the middle of our duty. But it is here. Yeah. Anytime you're missing something that was supposed to be passed by, probably in here. Do you want to pass these back? Yeah, well, we No, we were relieved of our duty. We were pretty cool to pass them back. Uh, on, on this, you wrote a grade on it, so I, I didn't put a grade on there, but I recorded it. And if it's wrong in Jupiter grades, let me know. It should be the grade that you told me. Oh, if we were absent that day, I remember I came back to class and we were going over it, but I was absent in class before. I think Rachel was absent. Okay. You can still submit it, just say if you were absent. If it says missing, then do that. If it's just blank, then it's not a problem. It's not hurting your grade, I don't really care. But if it is starting your grade, you can still turn it out. Um, now, so the shrink wrap. Shrink wrap molecules are polymers, which are strings of atoms or groups of atoms repeated. And they form strings. Even though they're made of many atoms in their natural state, they're relatively short because they're kinked and tangled. This is a, I don't know what an atomic force microscope is, but this is an image of some polymers taken with an atomic force microscope. Um, so you can see they're kind of tangled up. Shrink wrap is prepared by heating those polymers, stretching them, and then cooling them in a stretched orientation. So for whatever reason, they, uh, when you heat them up, they sort of loosen their bonds, which allows you to stretch them straight. And then when you cool them back off, and you stop stretching them, they stay like that. Cooling the polymers while they're stretched causes them to remain frozen in this unnatural stretch condition. When the shrink wrap is heated, the polymers are allowed to spring back to their shorter tangled orientation. So the shrink wrap shrinks. Number five, this is, uh, you had to sketch the rest of a boat and sketch one that was gonna right itself and be stable and then one that was not and be unstable. And this is my solution to the first one. So if you want a stable boat, generally if you make it really wide, it's, it's not gonna tip over easily. So I made, I just extended this part, which was already in the diagram, made it go way out, made the thing symmetric so it's boat-like. And, and then, the next step is to draw a vertical line through the center of mass. That separates everything so that you can figure out what, what kind of torques are going to be acting on the boat. It's going to pivot around the center of mass. You don't have to explain all that, but just show me a vertical line through the center of mass, and then you can say the water displaced to the right of the center of mass has a greater volume than the water displaced to the left. So that means you're going to have a greater force of buoyancy pushing up over here a weaker force of buoyancy pushing up over there, but the torque is going to straighten the boat back out. Guess what my next boat looks like? It's supposed to tip. It's supposed to be tipping just like that and keep on tipping. It looks a little bit like your boat. So how, how is it different from this boat? Skinny. Skinny. Not necessarily taller, but skinnier. So it's about the same height in this case. So if you have a boat like this, tip the same amount, and it's actually, it looks like about the same height. Then when you draw that line through the center of mass, you can see there's less water displaced to the right. So you have a really small amount of buoyancy or buoyant force pushing up and a much larger volume to the left. So this is gonna have 
clockwise torque is going to tip it over. It's all about just balancing the amount of displaced water to the left and the right of the center of mass. And which gets tricky because once your boat tips, the center of mass is, is on this tip axis. Stop me if you have questions, otherwise I'm just going to rush through so that we get done. Um, two boats are made of the same type of thin plywood. You, you're supposed to explain why having convex sides is more stable and it is less likely to be um, deformed than having straight sides. Is here? Do you want to? Well, because like it's like the arc, like it's spread the pressure spread all along the arc, whereas in the case, why? Huh? You're you're right. Curve, like, but why? How does that do it? What's the mechanism by which the, the pressure the, ends up being the spread? Key, the keystone. The keystone. Thing. But how does the keystone spread the pressure? So if you if you have an arc well, like, like this, it takes the pressure out and like displaces it to either side. Like the keystone takes the pressure from the top and like displaces it. Down the side. Where? Sort of. So the, does anybody remember what, what I was telling you when we talked about squeezing an egg? If you're trying to break an egg in your hand, it's it's fairly oh seems like it's getting easier these days. My my wife says eggs are getting thinner, but either that or I'm getting stronger. I try to do it anyway. Yes. Yeah. James is changed from what you call it, but a torque on the A bending force? Yeah, to a compression. Right, bending force to a compressional force. I don't think there were many people the day we did this. So um, what, I, what I wrote here is plywood is easily, and you're right, Esmir. Um, what you said is not really wrong, but it, it, there's a different way, a more direct way to explain it. Um, plywood's easily bent. If I want to bend this piece of plywood, I can do that. It's pretty hard. On the other hand, if I try to compress it like this, push down this way, it's really strong. So diagram A, this next page, this is showing if you push in the center of a piece of plywood, it's pretty easy to bend it. Diagram B, let me shrink this down so I can talk about it and read it. Diagram B shows what happens when a similar force is applied to a convex piece of plywood. As the force is applied, it gets resolved into vectors running somewhat parallel to the plywood's length. So, Esmir, if you're designing an arch, there's a particular it's called a catenary. A catenary, it's not like a, it's not a parabola exactly, but a catenary gives you the geometry that when you push down here, there, there end up being in component vectors that there's, there's really no component vector pushing this way. They all go along the, the, um, the arc. So the, the, the keystone pushes this way, and the next one pushes that way, and the next one pushes that way. If you have one pushing down here, it makes your arch unstable. If you have something pushing out like that, it's unstable. But by the particular geometry, the forces get directed parallel to the length of it. So instead of having a bending force like this, you get compressional forces along there. So if you had people holding this at, at both ends, if there were people holding this, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get pushed out at all. This would come down, and they would feel the weight but they wouldn't be pushed out. If you had people holding the ends of this and you pushed on it, when you're pushing down, that would actually force the people outside. So it's it's turning it from a situation where it's the force is, a, is acting on it in a, in a way that it's weak to a way that it's strong by turning that into a compressional force. Number seven. Anybody get a, an answer for number seven? Curious. How many pounds of ballast, or sorry, kilograms of ballast would need to go on the bottom of the boat? No idea. Anybody? No? Okay. So with this one, the, the answer I came up with is 135 kilograms. That's what I was going to say. Though. Is it? Yeah. You should have just said it. Come on. What? Say it. Can we go over all the math and like detail? Yes. So far, there really hasn't been much, though, right? No, there hasn't okay. been any. Yeah, I'll go over the math in detail. Yes. You have an extra packet? Yeah. And I the should have a long here. time ago put a link on my website. They're right here. There's some right there. Can you somebody pass one of these, or James can get it? Oh. All right. So this thing, this would be a very unstable boat. In the situation somebody's standing up in this boat, and the center of mass is way up here. So what, what, what's going to happen to this is that the thing is going to keep tipping. 
and you want to add enough ballast right there so it stops tipping. What's what's the minimum mass of ballast that has to be added to that little point down there so that it's not going to tip anymore? Um, the first thing I did, I've, I've been using this sheet of paper as an example, kind of messed it up. Use this side. Is I tried to figure out where the center of mass needs to be so that the bow won't tip. Where does it need to be so that the, the force of buoyancy on, on either side of the center of mass is equal? Or more to the point, where where does the center of mass need to be so that this volume of displaced water is about the same as that volume of this displaced water? So I got a piece of paper and I started moving it over like this. And when it's right here, if I put the center of mass somewhere along this line, then you're going to have a really small amount of displacement to the right of it. So small buoyant force, big buoyant force over here, thing's going to tip. And if I put the center of mass right there, I've, I've overshot. Now I've got a huge amount of displacement over here, smaller amount there. That, that's going too far. And I decided that somewhere about right here was best. This is where it, you, you just have to estimate. The way I came up with, came to that conclusion is when I got to where I thought it was right, when I, thought, when I got to what I thought was the right point, oops, I magnified this differently. I said to myself, this side over here is kind of like, if I take this shape, this polygon, and then I take this little triangle and flip it over, so that is now there, now these two things, this and this, look, look like they're about the same. So that was, that was just how I estimated where the center of mass needed to be. And once I got that, then it, it really wasn't too hard from there. The center of mass has to be on this vertical line, and it also is in the center of the boat. So somewhere on the dotted line, it's right where they intersect, which puts me at this dot right here. And by the way, I'm videoing this, so I'll, I'll put that on my website too. Um, so once you know that, the center of mass has got to be right here. This gives you the scale. Each of these dots is 0.1 meters apart. So from here to there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0.9 meters. And from the center of mass to the bottom of the boat is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0.6 meters. So I just want, I've got 90 kilograms centered here to begin with. I want to know how many kilograms I need to put there so that the, the total center of mass becomes this spot. And to do that, I set up this problem over here. If I have a, this is a stupid thing to do, but I like doing stupid things. Um, so if I want to find the center of mass of this, I just find the balance point of this stick. I've got a heavy mass on that side, it's sort of, that's sort of the lighter end, so the center of mass is going to be closer here. But the center of mass is always um, where the torques are equal. This had a torque going down, this had a torque going down, and they're, they're the same. So if I know this is 0.6 meters, that's, that's this distance. And I know this distance is 0.9 meters, and I know this, the mass there is 90 kilograms, then I can say this clockwise torque equals that counterclockwise torque because the torque should balance. 0.6 meters times x equals 0.9 meters times 90. Um, and then I solve for x, which is 135 kilograms. Now this torques are usually uh, lever arm times a force, force times radius. That's not force, but it's mass. Doesn't really matter. Force and mass are proportional, so you can do torques in terms of mass if you have a balance beam. Any questions? Eric Keller, is that good enough? Okay. Next one. The, the bonus. Did anybody else do the do the bonus? I'm not going to tell you how to do the bonus, but there will be a bonus just like this, except I'm going to change the numbers on the on the test. And to explain briefly what it was, in case you didn't read it, you've got this sailor who has flopped overboard, as sailors do sometimes. And, and the sailor center of mass is there. The canoe center of mass is here. The outrigger center of mass is there. This sailor, 60 kilograms, 30 kilograms, and um, 15 kilograms. And the first part is to figure out where's the collective center of mass. Excuse the interruption, please. Anne Barbano, please report to the main office. Anne Barbano, thank you. 
it ends up being point zero set about seven centimeters to the right of this. And then the second part is, um, in this situation, how many liters of water is this displacing? You're assuming that, yeah, how many liters of, assume that this has no mass, how many liters of water does that displace? And it's three liters. Just given the amount of mass sitting right there and how hard that would be pushing it down into the water and how much buoyancy it would take to balance it. But that's a bonus, you don't really have to do that. It'll be different numbers on the test. Number eight, this one, you don't have to go into detail like back when we did rocket stuff because we already did the detail part with rockets. What I really want you to know is for something to be stable, the center of mass needs to be ahead of the center of pressure. So if somebody's boat is just going like this and it keeps going swerving left or swerving right just randomly, the way you fix that is like adding fins to a rocket. You add a fin to the back of the boat, which is the keel. So she should add a keel behind her boat center of mass and it should either be really big or far enough back so that her center of pressure in the surface area that's, that's exposed to the water when the boat turns sideways, that center of pressure is behind the center of mass. You're just adding a big thing to the back. Um, and then as we saw with rockets, a freely rotating body will move noseward through a fluid if its CP is ahead of its CM. You don't have to explain why that is. That, that becomes a much harder thing to explain. Knots. This was another warm-up question. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing to know. I, I realize there are some typos in here. A knot is 1.15 miles per hour. And that seems like kind of a random thing, but the reason the knot is 1.15 miles per hour is because a nautical, it mile. a nautical mile is 1.15 miles, but the reason a nautical mile is 1.15 miles is because a boat traveling one knot directly northward or southward, so with a northward velocity or a southward velocity, is going to travel one minute of latitude every hour. So at a, um, on a globe, the equator is zero, North Pole is 90, and there's, so there are 90 different degrees. Each degree is divided into 60 minutes. So 540 minutes all to, no, no, 5,400 minutes all together between the, the equator and the North Pole. And a boat going one knot is going to travel one of those in an hour. So 5,400 hours to get from the North Pole to the equator going one knot. Uh, and the reason that's kind of useful to, to sailors, um, they still use it today, is that on a map, if you have lines of latitude, they're going to be like this. Near the equator, things aren't very distorted, but you get farther from the equator, and the latitude lines, even if this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, because of the way a map is distorted, um, it, you know, the, those spacings are different. But the cool thing is if you're going a certain number of knots, you might go from here to here in an hour. If you're going the same number of knots, you're going to go from here to here in, in an hour also, or from here to here. So you, tra you travel equal lines of latitude and equal times going equal numbers of knots. And it just makes, apparently makes the nautical calculations easier. The, what's, where does the word knot come from? That's a long explanation. The short answer is they have a string, they used to have a string that had knots in it. And the string was attached to a piece of wood, and the piece of wood they would throw overboard, and it would sit in the water, and the boat would leave it behind, and they'd have it on a spool, or the string on a spool, and the knots would come off of the spool, and they would that way figure out how many knots are coming off the spool every second and get the boat's speed. So the, um, they should say, knots were tied at regular intervals on there. But, I went the other way when I explained it in this thing. The thing that they throw overboard is called a chip log. But that's not really important. You can just say there were knots in a string that was attached to something they threw overboard. They used that to figure out how fast the chip was. Archimedes principle. We've been over that one before. Buoyant force acting on an object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. Number 11. How many people did this and got, a, got an answer? Nobody did it and got an answer. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, there's, uh, there are a lot of ways to do it. One way is just to guess and check. And it's really not a hard question to guess and check. You, you want a boat 
that's made out of some kind of material has to carry a certain load that I'm going to, it's going to be a different number on the test. You're, you're given how, mu how much mass the material has per square meter, and it's going to be a boat like this. It's got four sides, a bottom, and no top. Um, and I'll give you some sort of maximum draft, so it can't sink more than a certain distance under the water, and some kind of minimum freeboard, which means you have to have a certain amount of walls sticking out of the water. So the first, the, the just guessing method. If you want to provide dimensions of an acceptable boat, you want a boat that doesn't sink too deep and has pretty high walls. So you want to make it, if, it, if you don't want it to sink too deep, do you want to make the floor a small area or a big area? To keep it from sinking deep. Big. Big. And the, the biggest bang for your buck in terms of area is going to be when, when it's actually a square. If, it, if you make it long and skinny, um, you might not have much displacement. So the smart thing to do is just to say that the fl floor is a square. Make the floor really big and it'll probably work out. You'll probably just be able to say, this is 50 meters and this is 60 meters. And then the height, you can just make whatever you want. It'll probably work. But if you want to do this the anal retentive way, you can do what I did. and I designed a boat that has draft of exactly 0.1 meters, and I designed a boat that has freeboard of exactly 0.3 meters, and I just did some algebra to figure out how, how the boat should be designed. Here's how I did it. First, my diagram. I wanted 0.1 meters of draft, there's the water line. 0.3 meters is, is the freeboard, so the total height is 0.4. This is x, this is x. And the first thing I did is, is I wanted to get the boat mass. You can come up with two equations for the boat mass. The first one, you figure out how much area it has, multiply that by 15 kilograms per square meter, and you'll get it. So the, the floor is x squared. That's the area. Each side is 0.4 times x, and there are four of those. So 4 times 0.4 meters x. So the boat mass, multiplying that out, is 15x squared plus 24x. And then the total mass would be 15x squared plus 24x plus the 300 kilogram load. Now Archimedes' principle says that the total mass is also equal to the displaced water mass. So if I figure out how much water is displaced when it sinks to 0.1 meters, what, how many kilograms is that, then that will give me an equation for the mass too. Um, in order to get that, I use the density formula rearranged here, mass equals volume times density. So over here, this is the volume of the boat, x squared times 0.1 meters, or sorry, the volume of water displaced. That's the area of the bottom, the length times the width times the height of the displaced water, 0.1. And then I multiply that by the density of water, so that gives me the overall mass of the water. So I've got one equation for the mass of the water, which is equal to the mass of the boat, because Archimedes' principle says they're equal. We've got another equation for the mass of the boat. I set them both equal, which is awesome, because then I get to use the quadratic formula. How do you feel about the quadratic formula? I feel really good. Good friends? So, so anyway, so taking this, I, I think I took everything to that side and then flipped the thing over again something x squared minus something x minus something, and then put in the quadratic formula, and I came out with 2.03 meters for x. So, and checked it, and 2.03 meters makes everything work out just nicely. So I, that automatically gives me the answer to c and d. And I forgot to put the solution to b in here, but that solution is pretty simple. I'll, I'll I wrote some stuff on the board that I'll go over. This is how you would do B once you know that, that other stuff. Um, so for B, you have to figure out the total mass of your boat when it's fully loaded. And back a few steps ago, I said that the mass of the boat is equal to the mass of the water displaced. So boat mass equals kilograms of water displaced. And the kilograms of water displaced um, What did I do there? 
Oh, so I think that my order up here is kind of screwy. First thing I did is I got the, the volume of the boat below the waterline, this volume right here. And that volume of the boat is equal to the, the draft, which is 0.1 meters, times the area of the bottom. So if you multiply 2.03 times 2.03 times 0.1, it'll give you this volume. And then if you know the um, that volume in meters cubed, you can convert that to kilograms of water displaced. Every meter cubed is how many kilograms of water? Remember this? What's the density of water? Thousand kilograms per meter cubed. So every cubic meter, knowing that volume, you can use the density formula to figure out the mass of water. And if you know the mass of water that's displaced here, that is the mass of the boat. So when you do that in this situation, I get 410.5. I don't really have to do C and D because I set it up so that I would have those in the first place. I decided that those were going to be my two numbers. Now you could just, like I said, you could just guess. And, and this often, this is pretty easy to make this work. When I am grading your test, I'm going to be using this spreadsheet. And if you give me something like crazy, the length of your boat is 500 meters, and the width of your boat is 780 meters, and the height of your walls is going to be 400 meters, then this is the volume of water displaced in meters. This is your draft, 0.05, it's less than 0.1, so that works. This is the amount of freeboard, you have 400 meters of freeboard, so that's, you meet all the requirements. And um, the total boat mass is 2.1 times 10 to the 7. So, so it works, great, so good answer. So when in doubt, you have huge numbers? Just a big old wide bottom. Now if you, if you had a really long and skinny bottom, let's say it's, the length is 1,500 meters, and the width is, oh sorry, that's the width. I'll make it 0.1, 10 centimeters wide. Then the draft is 120 meters. It's gonna sink really deep if you make your boat this, this wide and uh, 1,500 meters long. But if you make it 1,500 meters long, then, you know, then your draft would be really small. The gold square boat is the answer. <laughs> The test is next Friday, and the test will be, there will be a question like that, but it won't have 15, it will have some other number, maybe 60, I don't know. And this won't be 0.3, it might be 0.35, I don't know. And the order may be different. This diagram, this diagram will be the same diagram, but the letters may be different. Maybe if I get around to it. <laughs> exactly. And this will be exactly the same. So will that. So the ones that there's really no good way to change. I don't think I'm going to be prepared for this. I don't think so. I don't think you prepared as well. I'm sorry. About 12. 12? Oh, 12. Yes. Is anyone else going to keep these donuts? You sure? There's no more. Number 12. I got my hand on that. This is the, whatever you provide for number 11, you have to use number 11 to answer number 12. That was a bad bite. Bite right there. It's me. I'm going to move my jacket. Come on, anything over there. Sorry, Emma. Oh, you're taking it out. Yeah, right? Yeah. Aren't they good? Okay. Yeah. So number 12, you have to take the boat that you just designed and tell it what the drag coefficient is. Um, and the, the boat is being pulled like our boats are being pulled. In this case, it's a one kilogram falling mass. It has a terminal velocity of 0.1 meters per second. But in this case, you can actually figure out its coefficient of drag, not the CDA. So here's the drag equation. And the reason you can actually get the CDA in this case is because you can tell exactly what the area is. If your boat is this, I still have a picture of a boat here. Yeah, if this is your boat and it's going this way, and this is the width of your boat, then this is what's hitting the hitting the water as it goes. So your your cross-sectional area, this is the whole boat. 
And this is the part that's underwater. Your cross-sectional area is just that area. It's the width of your boat multiplied by the draft. And if you have that, you can, um, we've got everything else we need. So the force of drag is equal to that. The force of drag is also equal to the force of that falling mass. And that's the, the mass multiplied by gravity. So all this equals 9.8 newtons in this case because the mass is one kilogram. So 9.8 equals one half times CD times the draft multiplied by the width times times the density of the water times the velocity squared and when you go through all that you get 9.66. That's a really high coefficient of drag. But depending on how ridiculous your boat is, who knows what you might get. Your, everybody's answer will be different on that one, unless you all coincidentally have exactly the same boat design. So B, at best, why is this a close approximation and not necessarily the right answer? <laughs> why isn't this a necessarily the right answer? Because your boat might not Like, well, yeah, yeah. So when your boat moves, uh, if you look at this diagram, when the boat's moving forward and there's water in front of it, do you think the water is going to maybe pile up a little bit and splash yeah. on the front, or converse? It might whatever. A bit. Alternatively, it might rise up on the water and it might plane a little bit. So um, the what I said is this assumes the cross-sectional area is the draft times the width. But when the boat's moving. Water may pile up in front of the boat, increasing A. The boat may also plane, decreasing A. But I also wrote that for a very low velocity, this is probably an accurate determination because you're not going to have it really doing much to the water. That's it. Sorry for not.